So in this lecture, we're going to move on to section 2.6, which is titled The Tradition of Craft. Um, so this section is a little different. And it brings up the question, what is the difference between art and craft? So what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase fine art? Probably pristine art museums filled with oil paintings and marble sculptures, right? Well, how about when you hear the phrase craft or maybe arts and crafts? This is probably more of a finger painting, popsicle stick wielding, macaroni necklace making situation, right? There's a sort of childish or unrefined connotation that kind of hangs on to the word craft. But why is that? So in the 15th, 14th and 15th century in Renaissance Europe, they considered art as something created for aesthetic value without practical use. And then by the 18th century, painting and sculpture were considered art, while ceramics, textile making, embroidery, other things, uh, these were considered craft. So craft, by definition, is an activity involving skill, um, a high skill in making things by hand. But really, it's come to refer to the items made for use. So Items that are functional, utilitarian objects um, made by hand, these are somehow considered lesser than art. But why? Simply because they are functional or meant for use? Um, I think there's also an idea in Western society that things like clay, wood, fibers, that these are somehow lesser medias because outside of Europe in so-called primitive areas, these were the primary materials for creative expression and often still are. Um, and so they're not, or excuse me, so Western society often considers those materials primitive themselves as if they don't require much skill or thought or imagination to use. The controversy doesn't make a lot of sense now, um, especially as we continue to become a more global environment. Um, Painters and sculptors are fine craftspeople that exhibit incredible technical skill with their hands, and craftspeople are no less skillful or creative or imaginative simply because they consider the functionality or the use of a different medium. So really the terms art and craft are impossible to separate. The distinction has largely been dismantled in the 20th and 21st centuries, but with the lumping together of ceramics, textiles, wood, glass, and metalwork into a single chapter like this, you can sort of see there are still some distinctions that are kind of made, um, really no matter the intention of the maker or the artist or whatever. Um, so as we go through this section, we're going to talk about um, ceramics, glass, fibers, and textiles for the most part. We discuss wood a bit with sculpture. Uh, we discuss metal a bit with sculpture. So um, we're going to focus in on these three. I feel like these three are the ones that get mm, pushed off into the world of craft and ignored by the fine art world a bit more. So, so we'll start with ceramics. So ceramic making is an additive process. It involves making an object by shaping clay and then baking it at high temperatures to harden it. Um, the word ceramics comes from the Greek word karamos, which means um, of pottery, which probably derived from a Sanskrit word, which was the language of ancient India, um, which meant to burn. Um, so clay is natural. Um, you can dig it from the earth just about anywhere and mixed with water it becomes plastic, which I don't mean plastic like a plastic bag here. Um, in this case plastic means moldable or cohesive, able to kind of um, pull and push without breaking, things like that. And ceramics is really one of the oldest um, art forms in the world. So this is a figure from Dolne Vestonice in the Czech Republic. Um, this was an important site. There was very early evidence here of the use of fire to create objects out of a precise mixture of soil and water, um, then baking that mixture at a precise temperature with the intent of creating um, a durable piece. So. The site of Dolne Vestonice was active around 23,000 BCE, so um, in the Paleolithic period here. 
Um, however, it is of note that the recipe of clay that they seem to have been using suggests they were attempting to make their pieces explode on purpose. Um, we're not sure if this was a purposeful thing or um, more of a trial and error, trying to figure out the correct mixture of clay and water and the correct temperature, things like that. Um, but again, it's very impressive that this is such an early example of ceramics. Um, typically, we don't see such use of ceramics until the Neolithic era, um, where we have what's called the Pottery Revolution, in which we have such an increase in ceramic making, it marks a shift from the reliance on skin, textile, and wooden containers. Um, now, most of this Neolithic era pottery is going to be low fired, um, largely in a hearth or a pit fire. Um, there are lots of pot sherds or pieces of pots from um, prehistoric settlements, and even though they're broken, they're very important. They're a major key in dating how old the site is um, and in reconstructing how those people would have lived, what their trading patterns would have been, maybe even the foods they would have eaten, um, things like that. So there are many different types of clay, each with its own set of characteristics, but really we have three main types of ceramics or three main types of um, clay used for ceramics. So the first of those is earthenware. Um, earthenware is quite pliable when it's wet, uh, but after firing at about 500 to 800 degrees, it's still quite porous and brittle. Um, so it won't dissolve in water, but it will absorb some unless it's glazed. Um, so think of this as a terracotta plant pot. Um, the second type is stoneware. So stoneware is much harder. It's less plastic when it's wet. Um, and it's typically um, fired at about 1200 to 1400 degrees, at which temperature the stone particles in the clay begin to vitrify or become glassy. Um, so the fired result is less porous than earthenware, but still relatively fragile and it still is slightly porous, so it should still be glazed if it's going to um, hold water or store food, things like that, um, which we'll talk about glazing more um, shortly. Um, the third type is porcelain. So porcelain is actually a mixture of three different clays, feldspar, kaolin, and silica. It's quite strong, but sometimes hard to work with, um, and the fired result is quite durable. It's fired at a very high temperature, and uh, the texture, the surface texture becomes quite smooth, almost virtually translucent and extremely glossy um, once it's finished. So the first true porcelain was made in China during the Tang Dynasty um, between about 618 and 906, and then in the Ming Dynasty, um, between 1368 and 1644, it had really become a major um, product for export there. So there's a reason we call our nicest dishes fine china, because for centuries, that's where the nicest dishes in the world were made. Um, so throughout this lecture, you're probably going to hear me use the terms ceramics and pottery pretty interchangeably. Um, there's a slight difference it's not too important, but um, ceramics refers to all baked or fired wares, um, whereas pottery is all of them except for porcelain, except for the most refined type. So after an artist has chosen uh, the clay that they want to work with, the first step that they need to do in the ceramic making process is called wedging. Um, so wedging involves kneading the clay to create a uniform um, consistency. They need to work out any air bubbles or air pockets um, within the clay because if they get trapped in the piece and then the piece goes in the kiln, it can actually explode because inside those air pockets, the moisture condenses as it is heated um, and then it begins to evaporate, but it has nowhere to escape. And so suddenly, boom your piece explodes um, under the pressure, um, which is never fun. So after wedging and um, achieving that uniform consistency, you can start to shape or build your object, which we'll look at some methods of ceramic shaping and building momentarily. Um, <clears throat> during this stage, it's 
plastic is what we call it. It's soft, workable clay that can be easily molded or formed. Now, there are several steps that can happen in here um, in the making stage. You can use slip or slurry, which is clay mixed with water into a glue-like consistency. You can use it to join pieces of clay together, um, but again, you have to be quite careful that there's no air trapped between, um, and you have to really attach them rather firmly. Um, but once your shape has been finished, you leave the clay to dry completely. Um, this is called greenware or bone dry clay. It's extremely fragile um, and it can break really just by looking at it sometimes. Um, so to further solidify it, it needs to be fired. So after a piece is totally dry, it is fired in a kiln or a special sort of oven that allows for high levels of control over the temperatures. Um, the ceramicist will slowly raise the temperature until it reaches the desired height, and then they slowly cool the kiln back down to prevent cracking. So after clay has been transformed into ceramic material, after it's been fired once, um, we call that bisque wear. It is technically ceramics at this point. It's permanently hard and it cannot be returned to that soft clay state. But now is when you apply the finishing touches. So now you can apply slip, again, that thin liquid clay mixture, sometimes mixed with um, different pigments um, for coloring. You can apply that, so you can apply glaze, which is a liquid mixture of clay, water, and other chemical compounds that when fired creates a glassy finish um, to the surface and adds color and texture and also makes the object watertight. Um, so that final firing melts and hardens the slip or glaze and fuses it to the clay body. Um, so let's look at a few different building techniques um, in ceramics. So hand building is exactly what it sounds like. It's shaping the clay with your hands using different methods. Um, so the first method and maybe the most basic is simply pinching, um, pinching and squeezing the clay between your fingers to sort of push it and pull it into a shape. This has been an effective method used for millennia. It's likely the method that was used um, for the figure made at the Dolne Vestanice site. Um, so here we have a work from about the 14th to 15th century um, from Indonesia. This is a terracotta work, and it depicts one of the mother goddesses. Um, her name is Harishai, um, sometimes called Menbraut. Um, this was made in the Majapahit period of Indonesia. Um, the artist likely pinched and squeezed the clay into these forms to honor the goddess. Um, and so this piece is actually a pillar ornament. It would have sort of been placed on the bottom portion of a pillar in an open pavilion. Um, and again, it portrays this mother goddess who is considered the protector of children. Um, and it's kind of hollowed out to fulfill its function, but that also helps prevent explosions in the kiln as well. Um, because again, if you get air pockets that are trapped inside the clay body, it can explode um, and really the thicker the wall of your piece or the thicker the piece of clay is, the more likely it is to explode. So um, hollowing it out is really your best option. So another common form of hand building is coil building or coiling, um, which involves rolling clay out on a flat surface until it extends into a rope or a worm um, that you can then coil up upon each other um, and then smooth those coils out to make a uniform wall of even elevation here. So here we have a seated Zapotec ruler made from about 300 BCE to about 700 CE. Um, this was likely made to be put in the tomb of a Zapotec ruler, maybe to represent a deity or to serve as a companion for the deceased. Um, the headdress and chest have two calendar dates carved in Zapotec writing. Um, but this is a very controlled kind of symmetrical form and you can sort of get the sense that this was in fact coil built. So you can maybe um, pick out some areas 
where the coils have been sort of smoothed together on the exterior to create that uniform surface. Um, coil building is really great for rounded forms because the organic lines of the coils can be controlled in ways that really complement the essence or spirit of the piece as a whole. Native peoples from the American Southwest have very distinct traditions of making fine symmetrical pots using the coiling method. Um, and this is a long-standing tradition that was really revived in the 20th century. Um, and archaeologists found several potsherds near San Ildefonso Pueblo in New Mexico, and he contacted local Tewa Pueblo potter Maria Montoya Martinez and asked if she could try to replicate the original pots using these potsherds. Um, so she does, and that really launched her career by allowing her to recreate ceramic objects of her ancestors using um, traditional methods, but also it allowed her to develop her own distinctive style that has really become internationally renowned. Martinez uses clay from the area, which is full of volcanic ash and gives it this um, nice dark, almost black color. Um, and she, again, uses that traditional coil building method. Um, she smooths the surfaces and burnishes them to a shine, burnishing meaning to sort of polish with uh, maybe a rock or the back of a spoon. Um, and then she goes back and paints on her designs using black slip. She fires the pieces in an open wood and manure fire. And mid-firing, the flames are smothered and the smoke helps turn the clay body the rich black color. Now, the areas that were burnished have a, so, excuse me, a high surface shine, while the areas that were slit uh, with her designs have a matte finish. So we have this nice uh, sort of contrast or juxtaposition between surface textures. Roxanne Spencel is a contemporary Santa Clara Pueblo potter from a long lineage of Pueblo potters and artists. Um, now, Pueblo women have long used pottery making as a major form of expression. Um, these people believe that clay is a product of Mother Earth and is therefore a living female being. Um, clay mother or clay old lady, she is called. Before digging clay, the potter should pray and give offerings to clay mother so that she will graciously allow herself to be taken by the people and bless the potter, um, excuse me, bless the pottery into being moldable. The potter and clay old lady really must collaborate to transform the clay into um, various domestic, secular, and sacred wares. So um, Swinzel learned traditional Pueblo coil building methods from her mother, who learned from her mother, um, but she uses that knowledge to create figurative sculptures that really explore her cultural heritage and self-identity through funny or exaggerated portrayals of traditional Pueblo beliefs. For example, the Pueblo creation story says that the ancestors once lived in a dark primordial world, a world without sickness or death alongside the gods, um, but eventually they emerged into a new world above that, which is this one. Um, so according to the story, the first four beings to emerge into the new world were kosha or sacred clowns um, and they sort of led the way for all of the other ancestors um, it's quite important to pueblo religion and culture these clowns they provide comic relief from the seriousness in life they teach lessons and represent growth and change or the emergence into a new stage of life so here in Swinsell's 1989 work, Emergence of the Clowns, she is depicting the very moment that these four kosha are doing just that. They're emerging from the old world to the new world. Um, and they've all sort of emerged at various stages here. They squint their eyes as they look around in the sunlight for the first time. Um, now, she's depicted these beings according to the traditional costume of ceremonial dancers who portray these sacred clowns during rituals. Um, they're unmasked. They are painted from head to toe with horizontal black and white stripes. There are cloths around their waists, and typically the hair is tied into two sort of bunches that mimic the horns of the kosha spirits. 
Um, now, the colors black and white represent spirits of the dead, but also the liminality of the clowns as spirit beings and as they first to emerge into the physical world. Another type of hand building is slab construction in which clay is rolled into sheets and allowed to dry slightly, just enough that it can support itself. Um, and then it can be either curled into a cylinder or draped over and pressed onto a mold or perhaps cut into shapes that are then joined together carefully at the corners and seams by a process of scratching or scoring the surface and applying water or slip as glue and then smoothing to prevent cracking or separating when firing. Um, slab construction is quite conducive for geometric shapes, uh, boxes, and things with flat sides. Here we have a work by the American ceramicist Peter Volkus. This is his Gallus Rock from 1960. Um, this is a large sculptural piece. It's about eight feet tall, and it's an interesting combination of slab building with wheel throwing. Um, it creates this very organic, kind of expressive form. Um, there are evident slabs here. We have big, flat areas, but it's not just a simple, straightforward cube or geometric shape, right? Um, here, the slabs have been used in sort of an interesting way. You can even see here we have these cylinders laid on their sides. Um, potentially, these were thrown, but um, something about the thickness and the way they've been sort of um, elongated here makes me think that those are slabs as well that have simply been curled into cylinders rather than um, left flat like this. That brings us to throwing which involves shaping clay as it turns on a potter's wheel. So the potter's wheel was probably invented in Mesopotamia sometime between about 6,000 and 4,000 BCE, though no one is sure when exactly. Um, we see evidence of an early wheel in use in Egypt by about 4,000 BCE, in the Near East by about 3250 BCE, and in China by 3000 BCE. The first potter's wheels were probably just mats or discs that artists would turn with their hands as they added coils and worked. Um, that eventually developed into a kick wheel that the artists would kick as they worked, um, which eventually evolved into the motorized wheel that we know today. Um, the potter's wheel allows a potter to produce hollow, rounded forms with great speed and uniformity. This is by far the fastest method of creating a hollow, rounded form. So I'll talk here about the process of throwing on a wheel a little, but I'll also share some videos so that you can sort of see for yourselves, and it'll probably make more sense um, in, in the video. But again, the process begins with wedging the clay to get rid of um, any air pockets or bubbles and to create a uniform consistency. Um, and then your clay, you need to center it on the wheel head. So you want to smack it down on the wheel head sort of as close to the center as possible. And then while the wheel is running, um, the artist performs a process called coning um, in which they squeeze with their hands. They squeeze the clay into a cone shape sort of up and down a few times. And that helps to align the particles uniformly and smoothly and really get it right in the very center of the wheel head. Now, Next is a process called opening, in which the artist creates a small depression or hole in the middle of the centered clay and presses down to the desired thickness of their base. And then they can begin to pull up the sides by uh, sort of pinching at the base and pulling upwards with their hands on either side. They can move clay um, from the base kind of upwards through the walls um, little bits at a time to create taller walls and thinner walls. So with throwing, essentially, it's all physics. Um, there's a combination of force exerted by the artist's hands as well as the centrifugal force of the spinning wheel. Um, there's actually a tendency for an object to fly outwards on a circular path um, when it's spinning like this. So oftentimes, if you don't attach your clay well enough to your wheel head, you start working and it goes flying off to one side. That's quite fun. Um, but the artist uses that force and the own force of their hands to push the clay into the desired shape, typically a rounded or cylindrical form. 
Um, the potter can employ sponges and scrapers as the pot spins to sort of further finish the surface, um, or they can allow the rings or the natural grooves from their fingertips to remain visible on the clay surface. But finally, when they're finished, the piece is cut from the wheel head using a wire and it's left to dry. Here we have a beautiful Ming Dynasty porcelain flask from about 1425 to 35. The Chinese ceramic artists invented porcelain, the most refined type of ceramic wares, and used um, a variety of high quality glazes on their porcelain. So this was made on a potter's wheel almost 600 years ago. Um, the Ming Dynasty potters were known for using multiple layers of glaze. Here they first used an intricate blue glaze over a white clay body um, and then a clear glaze over the top of that to create a sort of luxurious glossy finish. Um, so the imagery here, a dragon, this is a recurring symbol in Chinese culture, is thought to be a creature from which all other animals evolved and it's long been associated with benevolence, fertility, strength, protection, happiness, and goodness. Um, Ming Dynasty wares were so fine that they were used um, almost exclusively by the Emperor of China himself. Um, so works that were decorated with a three or four clawed dragon, which this one has three, um, these would have been intended for use at the Ming court as either gifts from the Emperor to his attendants or maybe for um, foreign rulers and dignitaries. Um, if this had five claws, then it would have been more likely for use by the emperor himself. So a five-clawed, two-horned dragon is representative of imperial might, and it's actually considered, or it was, considered treasonous to use that image elsewhere. And here's one more example, this time a more contemporary artist. This is Karen Farm's flower container from 1997. And this form, well, it's a few forms, actually. Each of these pieces, um, the bowl as well as each of the cylinders, would have had to have been thrown separately on the wheel and then sort of altered and fixed together um, to create the final shape. Um, so we have this asymmetrical form, but it's both kind of uniform and organic in its quality, right? Here we have a work by the artist Claire Tuomi. It's titled Made in China from 2010. Um, this is a sculptural installation that was intended to address authorship in contemporary craft contexts. Um, this installation consists of 80 porcelain vases, each of which are about one and a half meters tall, and each of which were produced in Jindazhen, the porcelain capital of China. So Tuomi had this idea while working as an artist in residence at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. She saw an exhibition that examined the differences in 13th century ceramics from Europe and from China. Um, she said there was this beautiful bowl made in Jingdezhen that really exemplified the wonderful examples, excuse me, the wonderful skills that existed in China. The things being made in Europe at that time did not have the same incredible delicacy. So, she had the idea for an installation that would contrast what was being made now in Jingdezhen, which is still a center of ceramic manufacturing in China, and what's being made now in European ceramic centers. So Tuomi found and communicated with a factory online. She said, I found this manufacturer that made big vases. We agreed on a surface design that was one of a plethora of standard designs that they offered. I acted like I was a hotel or any other purchaser and asked them to make 80 of them. They said they could make them in just three weeks. All 80 vases were made um, with molds. So rather than throwing them on the wheel, they were casted in molds and then assembled um, from several smaller pieces. They're all identical in shape and size. Um, so we could consider these mass produced. 79 of the vases were decorated by the Jingdezhen factory with inexpensive decals, fake gold, um, and it sort of easily scrapes off the surface. However, Tuomi chose to send one of the vases to England and have it hand decorated by the Royal Crown Derby. Um, this is a centuries old um, institution, sort of the industrial heart of British ceramic production, really known for their high quality um, and use of real 18 karat gold in their works. So the Jingdezhen factory in China they created 80 vases in 21 days. Um, the one vase that was shipped to England 
took just as long to decorate. So it took just as long to create one as it did 79 others, and it cost even more to have it hand decorated than it cost to have all 79 of the others um, decorated in China. So the work is really an interesting portrait of the international ceramic industry. Um, it kind of juxtaposes the efficient assembly processes of Chinese manufacturing, um, either by hand or machine, sort of lacking opportunities for individual creative freedoms, um, juxtaposes that with the increasingly luxurious British ceramic manufacturer that demands very high skill and a small workforce. Um, so this work sort of becomes a ratio of 79 to 1, kind of this tangible manifestation of this imbalance, really speaking to the economic reality, the mass production, and the cultural stereotypes that surround the um, originality and craft. Now, there is really so much more to ceramics than what we've talked about here. It's an incredibly versatile medium and conducive for all kinds of things, both functional and sculptural. It has a long, rich history, and the contemporary ceramics field is very much alive. And while I would love to talk to you more about various ceramic artists and pieces for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and move on to glass. So like ceramics, glassmaking relies on heat and materials dug from the earth. Um, quartz sand or silica, soda or sodium carbonate, and lime, calcium oxide, are heated at very high temperatures, uh, something around 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and then quickly cooled, and this becomes molten glass. Glass first appears during the second century BCE in Egypt and Mesopotamia, um, typically in the form of cast glass beads, pendants, and inlays used for reliefs, etc. Um, casting requires pouring molten glass into a mold to create a solid piece. Um, another technique used was called core forming, um, in which a hollow glass vessel could be created. So, in this technique, pliable molten glass was wrapped around a soft form um, and then maybe attached to a metal rod. And then once the glass hardens in the shape of the form, the soft interior is scraped out. Um, so here we're looking at a fish-shaped perfume bottle from the 18th dynasty in ancient Egypt. Um, they, this dynasty was really renowned for their core form glassworks, um, including containers for scented oils and perfumes, like this one, um, and often they featured very colorful uh, stripes, like this one does. In the first century BCE, the invention of glass blowing in Syria really revolutionized the use of glass. Um, and then this technique was adopted and perfected by the Romans and really became a major industry of the empire. So, glass blowing is a process in which a vessel is formed by forcing air into molten glass, um, usually by blowing through a hollow tube. So I'll talk a bit about glass blowing as a process here, but be sure to watch the YouTube video that I'll share on Blackboard. It will make much more sense um, in that video. So the first step is you have to get molten glass. So clear glass is melted in a furnace, which is called a crucible. Then, then the artist dips a pipe or punty into the furnace and gathers a layer of molten glass on the end. So a pipe is obviously just what it sounds like, and it's used to create hollow objects, whereas a punty is used to create solid objects or to finish off the hollow objects. After they've gathered their molten glass, the artist can then roll it on a steel table called a marver to help create the general vessel shape. Then they sit and rest the pipe across a workbench, kind of turning it with one hand or more commonly, um, their assistant sits on one end and turns it while they work on the other end. Um, but they can shape the molten glass um, using different tools like wooden paddles or blocks, damp newspaper, stainless steel tools, etc. Um, they can also swing the pipe around to sort of elongate the shape. They can add additional pieces of clear or colored glass. And of course, as seen in the photo here, they can blow air through that pipe to sort of inflate the glass and create that hollow form. However, 
While they're working, if the glass cools too much, it will no longer be pliable and so it will break. So, the glass must be repeatedly heated in order to keep it workable. Um, so there's a second smaller furnace called a glory hole in which the artist uses to sort of go reheat their piece, come back over to the workbench, work on it for a while, go reheat their piece, come back, work on it for a while, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's a repeating cycle until finally, once the artist is satisfied, they transfer their glass object from the pipe to the punty, which has been sort of heating over the flames in preparation. And then they can shape the opening of the vessel. A small glob of molten glass is used, it's stuck on the punty to help stick it to the bottom side of the piece. Um, and then the blowpipe is tapped to help it break away from the other side. The artist reheats the vessel again and shapes the opening and then firmly smacks the punty to allow the glass object to break off and drop into what's called an annealer, which is sort of a fire insulated furnace box that allows the object to cool slowly and prevents cracking or breaking. So here we're looking at an example of Roman glass blowing. This was created in the first century. Um, this is titled the Portland Vase, which the name comes from. It was once owned by the Duchess of Portland, but it was made in the Roman Empire. So this was actually created using a dip overlay method um, in which the elongated bubble of blue glass was partially dipped into molten white glass before being blown together. Um, after cooling, the white layer was cut away to create this design. So they removed the white to expose the negative space, which is the blue background, while the white is the positive um, shape. Dale Chihuly is a contemporary American glass artist. Um, this is his 1998 Fiore di Como. Um, it's installed in the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas. Um, it consists of 2,000 individually blown glass flowers. Um, we've got these very strong, kind of vibrant colors, creates a nice dazzling visual effect, almost like ink drops across water. Um, really creates a lot of visual interest and enlivens the space. Um, and I think it's quite appropriate for a Las Vegas hotel. Um, here's another. Here's another, this one is at the Dallas Arboretum. Um, I mentioned that typically a glass blower has an assistant who helps them. Um, Julie has a whole team of craftspeople that work for him at this point. So he is very involved in the design and concept um, while the craftsmen in the workshops are typically the ones who are actually creating the glass blown pieces. Um, sort of similar to, we talked about Andy Warhol and his, um, his artist studio factory, um, sort of similar. Chihuly had an exhibit at Crystal Bridges a few years ago, um, quite impressive, really just sort of fantastical and imaginative, especially when set amongst nature out on the Crystal Bridges kind of grounds and trails. Um, I, don't think all of these are still at Crystal Bridges, but there are some, um, like this one, um, which is really just so lovely. It really enhances the um, already beautiful space, I think. So we also need to talk about stained glass, which really became popular in the 12th century in medieval Europe. Stained glass is made by adding metallic salts to the glass as it's manufactured. Um, a variety of different colors can be rolled out into squares, either cut or broken into fragments, and then assembled over a drawing um, that's marked out in chalk. And then those fragments of glass are joined together by strips of molten lead. So we have this whole window strengthened by an armature of iron bands that kind of runs within it. Um, the technique had been used previously on a smaller scale, but Really, it was in the 12th century that the French used this to make these huge windows that really bathed the interiors of Gothic cathedrals in this heavenly, multicolored light. Chartres Cathedral in France has some of the most impressive stained glass. Um, this is the rose window in lancets in the north transept. Um, this is mostly stained glass, although there is some um, sort of 
painted glass in here as well, which is the common combination for the time. Um, and this was created in the 13th century. Most of the stained glass is original, um, although not all of it. Anyway, the rose window here is about 42 inches in diameter. This was commissioned by the French Queen Blanche of Castile, and it's dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Um, it proclaims the royal and spiritual heritage of Mary and Jesus Christ, and subsequently of the church itself. So at the center of the rose, right about here, um, we have Mary holding her divine son, depicted as the queen of heaven. Um, she's surrounded by representations of three doves and eight angels, and encircled by diamond-shaped panels that show 12 Old Testament kings from the um, tree of Jesse or Christ's ancestors. Um, now the periphery of the rose is a semicircular window um, units that depict Old Testament prophets who foretold Christ's birth. The rose window surmounts five more long, narrow lancet windows, they're called, um, and these depict various people. The center one depicts St. Anne holding her infant daughter, which is Mary. Um, and then we have four others that depict Old Testament priests and kings that prefigure the life of Christ. Now, throughout this, we also have several royal emblems scattered. So you might notice some yellow three-towered castle-like shapes against a red background. That was the queen's coat of arms. There are also blue quatrefoils with golden fleur-de-lis, which were symbolic of the French monarchy. Um, so the entire window here really glowed with deep blues and bright reds and created this hazy purse. <clears throat> excuse me, hazy purple atmosphere um, within the church. So now we'll look at fibers and textiles. So fibers are threads that are made from natural materials, animal or plant materials, maybe fur, wool, silk, cotton, flax, linen. Um, but more recently, we also have synthetic materials like nylon and polyester. Most often, fibers are associated with the creation of textiles, usually by spinning the fibers into thread, string, or yarn, and then weaving or knitting them into lengths of textile. Embroidery is also, it kind of falls in this category as well. Um, it involves applying thread, string, or yarn to a textile with various stitching techniques. Um, and fibers and textiles can also include stiff plant fibers like grasses and rushes that are woven into mats or baskets uh, and various objects. So. The Paracas culture in the South Pacific coast um, in the central Andes region, which is in present day Peru, um, they were active between about 600 and 150 BCE. And they were really one of the earliest known South American societies. And they produced some of the most spectacular textiles of South American peoples. The Paracas culture lived in a very dry desert climate. So miraculously, there have been several examples of these textiles that are quite well preserved. Um, this one is a detail, so we're just looking at a small portion of a textile, um, of a mantle, which is sort of a cap-like garment used for burial purposes. Um, but it dates to the third century BCE. Um, so quite impressive that it's in such good shape. But we have this intricate embroidered stitching form that creates a pattern of repeated figures um, with these animal-like costumes. The outline of the figure's body parts, the clawed hands and feet, and vine-like swirls become little serpents where there are um, also little deer on each shoulder. And it sort of seems like maybe the figure is holding more snakes in his hands. Um, it's likely that this is a mythical being, maybe a shaman. Um, in transformation to their animal spirit form. Um, and this is made of wool, which being in Peru, or present day Peru, I would assume um, alpaca wool. There have been several textile fragments found in vast Paracas communal burial sites. Um, some of these included as many as 420 bodies. Um, so it seems that Layers and layers of cloth would be wrapped around mummified bodies um, with the most intricate textiles on the exterior of these bundles. Um, this was meant to show 
great signs of wealth, maybe status in the afterlife, but probably also to sort of um, protect the mummified body as well. Um, Oftentimes, these textiles depict myths, uh, zoomorphic beings, or sort of animal-like, human-like mixtures. Um, they're often associated with the earth, sky, and sea, um, or the deceased and performing rituals for the deceased. Here we have a Hawaiian ahu'ula cloak, um, or a feathered cape. Um, these were ceremonial um, or maybe made for warfare, but attire for indigenous Hawaiian nobility. Um, the ahu'ula is made of feathers that are knotted onto a coconut or other plant fiber netting or sort of framework. Um, these would have been used um, as armor in combat, but they were also thought to offer protection from the gods. Um, the cloaks were considered to have mana or spiritual power, and they could only be made by specialists um, who were generally men, which is kind of interesting. I think textiles are often associated as uh, women's crafts or women's art forms, um, but in many societies, um, they're actually men's art forms. So. Now, these specialists... Um, they would have been trained in the techniques and rituals associated with the fabrication of these. Um, again, they're symbols of high social status and reserved for the elites. The red feathers come from the iwi bird, whereas the yellow feathers come from the uu bird. Um, the yellow birds are very rare, so a cloak with yellow feathers is considered more valuable. Um, so the ahu'ula would have been considered a prized possession and passed from generation to generation, unless it was taken by enemies as a war trophy. This one in particular was presented by King Kamehameha III to the American naval officer Lawrence Kearney as a gesture of gratitude for his diplomatic service to Hawaii. Here we have a Chilkat blanket created by the Tlingit tribe in Alaska um, sometime between 1870 and 90. Um, so Chilkat blankets are woven by the Tlingit, Haida, and Simshan tribes of um, Native Americans along the Pacific Northwest coast. These can take up to a year to create. Um, they are status symbols and they're worn um, sort of draped across the shoulders during special occasions such as a potlatch where they might be presented to honored guests as gifts. Um, they could also be used for dancing or maybe hung outside of a grave house as a token of esteem. Um, they're very highly valued, expensive, um, and again, a symbol of status and wealth. Both men and women help create these. Um, Typically, men designed the pattern and created what's called a pattern board and the loom, um, and they also provide the wool. And women gather cedar bark, prepare the yarn by spinning and dyeing it, and then weave the blanket itself. The designs are often highly stylized in what's called form line design, um, and it's sort of ambiguous and hard to decipher. Um, so form line design is um, the use of these sort of organic or curvilinear shapes that are sort of nestled within one another in, in various colors. Um, you can sort of see a central face there and maybe pick out some smaller faces in some of the other areas. Um, now because of the way these are woven, you can really achieve true curves in the design where as in most weaving techniques, you're limited to a sort of geometric grid. Um, so there is a frame and the warp threads are hung across a bar and weighted at the bottom, while the weft thread is woven by fingers um, through a process called twining. Um, so here we have a Chilkat coat, so same process, but a coat rather than a blanket. Um, and on the left side, you can see the pattern board created for that coat. So the pattern board, again, would have been made by the men, whereas the coat itself would have been created by women but you can see how the pattern has been painted on the board there um, for the women to follow as they are weaving the material. Faith Ringgold was an abstract painter in the 50s, um, and she became inspired by the civil rights movement and the feminist movements in America. Um, and she started combining painting on canvas with traditional quilting skills of her family and ancestors. 
Ringgold's great-great-grandmother was a slave who had made quilts for plantation owners. Um, so the history of quilting in Black American culture began pretty early in the 17th century with enslaved women sewing and quilting patchwork blankets from scraps of fabric from slave owners' homes, really for utilitarian purposes, to keep them and their families warm, but it quickly evolved into a long-standing tradition that allows women to tell stories, share knowledge, and find community. Now, these women didn't invent quilting. In fact, the earliest known quilt is dated to about the 4th century BCE in Egypt. Um, but again, it's quite a long-standing tradition at this point. African textile traditions include bright colors, large shapes, and quite a bit of asymmetry, and that was continued by many African-American quilters. Um, the use of scraps allowed them to create abstract designs that had really never been seen before in quilting. Um, Guy's Bend in Boykin, Alabama was one of the most prominent groups of quilters, and they are still active today. So, back to Faith Ringgold. She started to create these story quilts in the 1980s in which she combines representational subject matter, written text, acrylic paint, and African-American quilting traditions to create a visual narrative that is richly layered in meaning. Um, she typically worked on the painted parts of the quilt and her mother stitched the quilted border. Um, this one in particular is titled Tar Beach, and it tells the story from the point of view of an eight-year-old named Cassie, um, but the story is actually inspired by Ringgold's own memories of growing up in Harlem. Tar Beach refers to the rooftop of the apartment building where her family would sleep on hot summer nights. She described this as a magical place. Um, so in the composition, we have Cassie playing with her brother while her parents play cards with some neighbors at the table. Um, white horizontal panels um, feature a handwritten account of Cassie's dream um, in which she can fly over the city and claim possession of anything she flies over. So in her dream, she claims possession of the George Washington Bridge for herself. Um, she claims a new union constructed building for her father, who was a factory worker, but was not allowed to join the union because he was black. Um, she also claims an ice cream factory for her mom. So we have this sort of charming human scene uh, void of stereotypes, and it really shows sort of the social and economic limitations of um, race at the time and um, kind of the experience of the artist as well. And it incorporates those long-lasting um, African textile traditions and African-American quilting traditions, so really bringing in um, her cultural heritage as well. Here we have Sheila Hicks' The Silk Rainforest from 1975. This is um, made with silk, linen, and cotton, and this one is in your book. Um, Hicks is a contemporary artist, um, and she has developed interesting techniques to sort of modernize traditional weaving. Um, she explores fibers on a massive scale and in very expressive ways. She's interested in the tactile characteristics of silk, linen, and cotton materials. Um, her compositions are not meant to be representational, but to create a more holistic viewer experience by emphasizing the physical sensation of touch and the rich visual perception um, of the materials via the contrasting colors and textures. And last but certainly not least, we have Toshiko Horiyoshi Makaram, a Japanese artist. This is their Knitted Wonder Space number two from 2009. Um, so knitting is a process of creating fabric using loops and stitching. Um, and you can use various materials like wool, cotton, nylon, etc. cetera. Um, McAdam is a Japanese artist who was born in 1940 and they create entire knitted interactive environments. This one was designed as a children's playground, but she builds these sort of large knitted fiber pieces in her Canada studio and then installs them according to the space. But it's really sort of challenging to the preconceived notions of fiber art.